Buenos días. Buenos días a todos. En nombre del patronato de la Fundación Ramón Areces, de sus consejos científicos y de la dirección, permítanme que les exprese todo nuestro agradecimiento de que hayan venido hoy aquí a escuchar unas intervenciones de profesores del MIT de un altísimo nivel, espero, y sobre temas de gran actualidad. Una bienvenida afectuosa y un agradecimiento muy especial a los compañeros del MIT que han hecho posible la organización de este evento. Me refiero muy especialmente a Eduardo Garrido y a Klaus Schleicher, viejos amigos y cómplices en tantos eventos. Como ya dije en su día, alían la chispa latina con el método y el orden anglosajón. Trabajamos juntos, creo que con eficacia y, sobre todo, con sentido del humor. Un recuerdo afectuoso también a Carl Koster, viejo compañero de fatigas también del MIT, que se acaba de jubilar. Este encuentro es el quinto de los que ya llevamos organizados desde la firma del Acuerdo de Colaboración Estratégica con el MIT. Acuerdo que, por supuesto, no se limita solo a este evento, sino a otras muchas colaboraciones. Para nosotros es una satisfacción y un privilegio estar asociados a una institución de excelencia como el MIT, que para situarnos en orden de magnitud tiene en su historial 98 premios Nobel. Todo queda dicho con esto, creo. Convendrán conmigo que con los múltiples temas que hubiéramos podido seleccionar, el actual, denominado el futuro de la energía abordando el cambio climático, recoge dos de los temas que hoy más preocupan en el mundo y, desde luego, en España, donde ocupan un lugar central en el debate político y de sociedad. Estamos en un mundo en aceleración histórica permanente, en el que la pandemia y el conflicto de Ucrania están cambiando no solo las reglas de juego, sino las verdades acuñadas sobre la seguridad internacional y el equilibrio internacional. También se está modificando la estabilidad en los parámetros mundiales de la salud pública, así como los parámetros básicos del clima. En este contexto, resulta más necesario que nunca profundizar en constantes básicas y fundamentales para nuestra vida y la vida del planeta, como son el futuro de la energía y el cambio climático. Para ello, contamos con un plantel de lujo de cuatro profesores destacados del MIT, a quienes agradezco enormemente que se hayan desplazado hoy a Madrid. Queremos presentar a la sociedad española los últimos análisis sobre las últimas reflexiones que se están llevando a cabo en el mundo de la academia sobre estos temas. Son temas que nos afectan muy directamente a todos en nuestra vida cotidiana. ¿Qué modelo energético vamos a tener y cómo va a incidir en nuestra vida la dramática evolución del cambio climático? ¿Qué fuentes de energía limpia van a ser en un próximo futuro de verdad, en un próximo futuro de verdad eficientes? ¿Podrán las nuevas tecnologías modificar a nuestro favor estas preocupantes tendencias actuales, ni más ni menos. Nuestros amigos del MIT nos van a ilustrar sobre esta y muchas otras cuestiones trascendentales, como por ejemplo la fusión, la captura y almacenamiento de dióxido de carbono, etc. Nuestros amigos profesores del MIT nos van a acercar a la verdad en estos temas y, como decía Cocteau, hay verdades que uno solo puede decir después de haberse ganado el derecho a decirlas. Muchas gracias. Doy la palabra a mi compañero Klaus Schleicher. Muchísimas gracias, Ramundo. En nombre de, de Mati le quiero dar también la, la bienvenida. Y si me permiten, voy a cambiar el inglés porque para mí es un poco más fácil para hablar de inglés. Y I'm just going to give you a quick overview about MIT and um, the Kendall Square, which actually has been called the most innovation square model in the world. So around Kendall Square and, and, and Vassa Street. And the center of it is actually it's, it's MIT, and there's like a drone footage which I'm it's running right now over this, which shows you a little bit the campus. I'm going to not spend a lot of time on this, but just the, the visibility 
but actually has become the center of innovation, one of the greatest uh, places on earth really to invent stuff and help the humanity to move forward. But we don't do this all alone. So Massachusetts actually has been named one of the most innovative states in, in the United States on it. And if I move over to the next slide, you will actually see that in Massachusetts we have about 52 colleges, which are all in the greater Boston area with about 250,000 students. And if the students are not there, Boston feels actually really, really, really empty. And we also have some really high-class hospitals where we collaborate with MIT. MIT doesn't have actually a medical school, but a very close collaboration with some of the local hospitals on it, which are really uh, world-class hospitals when it comes really to cancer research and improving humanity on it. And of course, around this, actually, you found a lot of uh, robust VC funding that actually helps commercializing some of the inventions that come out of MIT. And MIT, I don't know if you're aware of that, actually we have now six schools, the School of Architecture and Planning, the School of Engineering, Humanity, Arts and Social Sciences, now the School of Management, the School of Science, and uh, the new school of uh, Schwarzman College of Computing, which will look at artificial intelligence and the future of computing, like quantum computing on it. And MIT is really, really focused now on practical commercial impact. So it attracts also the talents of the world that really would like to have an impact and work on something that's going to be used. So working with industry is utmost important to us because the real issues sit in industry and cooperation with industry is a really important factor on it. But we also focus on some really practical commercial value and we actually have a lot of initiatives that go around, now where's the energy going to come from in the next 50 years? How are we going to do this? And I'm really glad that we have Professor White here with us that actually is going to talk about what fusion is going to be and going to mean in the future and where it's at today. Uh, we talk about not a digital world, not digital learning. How will people actually learn in the future and actually have an initiative around this? We talk about really the environment and the global impact and sustainability. So you've seen already dust coming out from Africa, which I've never heard of in Madrid that this actually happened. And I asked a couple of people today, and they said uh, they can't remember that they have seen actually this dust and sand actually being carried over from the Sahara, and it actually reached all the way to Germany and to, to, the, to the UK on it. We have the quest for intelligence, where we really try to figure out what is human intelligence and how do we translate it into engineering terms. Because when you look at artificial intelligence today, as it, it's a lookup table. It's 40 years old. We have more computing power on it, but it's really not reflecting the way how humans learn. So we try to understand how is the brain working? How do kids work? Uh, and how do kids learn? And how do we translate this in engineering terms and actually put this into tools that are easy to use? We look at the innovation. So what is innovation? How do you translate it actually in operational terms? No, because innovation is very risky. No? And how do you actually make a shareholder value by really fostering innovation? And how do you put the science around on it? And then really an understanding on it, how will people work in the future for the future of work? So in MIT in 2020, during the pandemic, we spent about $762 million on, on research and R&D on it. And 23% of that came from industry. That's actually uh, the highest percentage of sponsored research from industry in any university around the world. So it is a really, really important factor to work very closely with industry. The rest pretty much comes from government and foundations on it, but there's also another lab that's called the Lincoln Labs that actually has a very similar spend that you mostly focused on classified research on it. So it's about $1.6 billion that MIT actually invests in research and uh, uh, in R&D every year. But we do this also with a very small staff and very, very small footprint. We only have about 1,100 faculty and about 2,300 uh, researchers and academic staff around on it. But out of this, we actually produced 98 uh, Nobel laureates and other very uh, accreditations on it. And the student population is about 11,200 on it, where actually the majority is actually graduate students, about 6,800, that are focusing solely on research. And that's the mission of MIT as well to really uh, focus on research and, 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 and uh, education. Interesting enough also, when we look at the last 60 years, we produced about 33,000 startup companies. So these are actually faculty, students, researchers that actually took the research out of the lab and commercializing it. 
They can't do it at MIT because MIT is a non-for-profit, but we actually do it outside on it. So these 33,000, every year there's about 50 to 100 companies more. They produce about $2 trillion of revenue every year. So the commercial impact of MIT is quite wide-reaching on it. And they're not all stay in the United States because we have a very global footprint. About 23% of them are actually outside of the US. So it's quite a commercial impact that actually uh, MIT produced. You know? And at the core of all this is pretty much the office where I work in, by Eduardo and Jose Garrido actually works on it, which is the Industrial Liaison Program, which is actually was designed 70 years ago to make the connection between the academics that happening at MIT and what's going on in industry, and actually making a matchmaking between the whole thing. We build a partnership to understand what are the issues in industry and who's actually going to be working on it in, in the faculty and actually match, match the interest on it. Um, and, of course, we have started actually looking at a very much uh, closer look at the startups because that's interesting of the industry as well. As we, we, we started actually a program that's called the MIT Startup Exchange, and we followed the last 1,800 startups because that's of interest to industry as well. What do these startups actually do? How they commercialize some of the inventions out of the labs on it? And we actually present them to industry for multiple reasons on it. Industry might collaborate with them, might invest in them, might actually think of uh, uh, buying them. And for the startups, of course, it is a big help to actually move forward, to actually establish themselves, you know, and uh, it helps the ecosystem of MIT. In per year, we do about 600 to 800 introductions just for the startups with industry. So, but I want to conclude also to kind of like say in the pandemics where we pretty much were shut down, you know, and I picked like 10 of the breakthrough achievements from MIT that really actually struck me when I looked at what actually happened in the last two years. And last year, we did quite a few interesting things, for example. For example, we discovered you no know, way to jumpstart the immune system to actually track and, and cure tumors, which comes actually from an engineering background, not the medical school, but in collaboration with some of the hospitals on it. I'm not going to read through all of them, but we actually found a way actually to actually create a vaccine that can be inhaled, because nobody likes to have an injection, so you can actually uh, get it through the nose. We found a way to actually program fibers that actually can regulate the temperature and actually put functionality in the clothes, which is about four to 6,000 years old, so a new way of actually creating clothes on it. Um, we developed actually a face mask that actually can detect if somebody actually has COVID, uh, we confirmed actually Hawkins' black hole theory, which said that a black hole is going to swallow everything up, and this theory actually has been confirmed. And what Professor White is going to talk about today, that we actually made a major breakthrough in the fusion direction by actually developing new electromagnets that actually produce a strength of 20 Tesla. It's the highest magnetic field on Earth that actually has been achieved. So, and that's due to some new materials on it. And I'll leave it with this. And I think I'm going to give it over to Eduardo, who's going to do the moderation. So, muchísimas gracias para venir. Eduardo, 